said, is Robert Roger. I'm based in Amsterdam, and I work as a data scientist in, uh, at a data science and engineering consultancy called Go Data Driven. By the way, uh, if any of you uh, are looking at moving to the Netherlands and you'd like to do a data engineering work, uh, come talk to me during the break. Anyway, last year, uh, I got up on stage here at Berlin Buzzwords to talk about an idea for using machine learning to build database indexes, a non-traditional technique for a field acquainted with the certainties of deterministic algorithms. This year, I'd like again to talk about applying machine learning in a novel way, this time in the search space. That's not to say that machine learning techniques are completely unfamiliar to the search community. For instance, a uh, machine learning model sits behind every learning to rank system, uh, which re-ranks sets of documents based on signals drawn from the documents themselves and the query that prompted their retrieval. Uh, machine learning classifiers are applied to the text of user queries to categorize query intent. And machine learning systems like Google's RankBrain can completely reformulate infrequently encountered user queries in such a way that they resemble more common queries for which your system has much higher confidence in its results. Now, all these techniques, however, surround the system, which creates the internal representation of our documents. And typically, the way we do it now, with what essentially boils down to inverted indexes, is a pretty reasonable approach. Even after applying query expansion methods or when we want to re-rank, we eventually end up wanting to check for the presence or absence of specific words in our document, and that's exactly what inverted indexes do well. But what happens when the query language and the language of the document are different? For instance, if our query language had been, say, English, and our target language, say, German, uh, we could at least try translating the query using Google Translate, and then parsing the result using uh, the usual IR tooling. But what do you do when the query language is English while the document language is, say, Java? Now, this is the problem of code search. More concretely, say you're in the situation where we're working at a company and there's this big existing code base contributed to by, over time, dozens or more devs, and you want to avoid rewriting some functionality if there's already some method that handles it. Now, traditionally, what you do is you'd ask around by the senior devs or by whomever had shouldered the sort of archivist role, or you'd refer to some internal code documentation source. But institutional knowledge has a nasty habit of going on vacation or getting sick or moving on to another company, and documentation needs to be, well, first of all, written and thereafter consistently updated. So even assuming you've got excellent documentation coverage and it's up to date, there remains the problem of searching that documentation with traditional IR tools. For one, uh, IR tools tend to focus on word presence and ignore word order. And these tools will then fail us when we, for instance, want the method to queue an event on the run, sorry, to be run on the thread, and instead gets hits for the method that will run an event on a thread queue. For another, IR tools tend not to be aware of semantic synonyms. So if we query for read in and the documentation says parse, our search system will miss relevant hits. And lastly, IR tools tend to be confused by noise. So for instance, the query get the content of an input stream as a string using a specified character encoding has a relevant token specified in character, which might lead our search system to produce false positives. So let's say then that at best you can treat the doc strings of your code base as a weak search signal. How do you then go about finding relevant code snippets? Well, in principle, all that you need to know is embedded in the structure and syntax of the code itself. The problem is then finding a way to pair the code with a relevant natural language description of what the code does in such a way that our natural language queries can find it. And what I want to talk about today, one very modern solution to this problem, is called DeepCS. Uh, DeepCS creates a mathematical representation of both uh, the code and of natural language, where both code snippets and English sentences are mapped to vectors in the same vector space, in such a way that, for instance, the vector for the query extract an object from an XML file gets mapped close to the vector of the code doing exactly that, 
Now, be, to be clear, this is not my idea. DeepCS was designed by a team consisting of Zhao Donggu and Sung Gung Kim from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology and Hong Yung Zhang from the University of Newcastle in Australia. I just think this is a really neat idea and an interesting example of how contemporary machine learning can play a role in search. What uh, those of you who attended Johan Brath's uh, talk yesterday about Vespa uh, might have heard to us uh, Search 2.0. Now, despite the academic origins of this talk, I promised a beginner level introduction. So this is how I propose we walk through the idea. First, we'll talk about vector representations of natural language and in particular, how we can go from representations for words to representations of documents. Second, uh, we'll talk about how the same idea can be used to create vector representations of code. Third, we'll talk about how we can learn these two representations simultaneously through what's called a joint embedding and what the authors of the paper accomplished in a the model they call the Code Description Embedding Neural Network, or CodeNN. And lastly, we'll talk about how these representations can be first trained and then used to perform code search in a system the authors of the paper called DeepCS. Sound good? Okay, now let's get started. So let's start with the more familiar bit, transforming a bit of text into a vector. Now as a first approach, we could start with a large data set of text examples and make a dictionary using all of the unique words we uh, find in that data set. And then to prepare our documents mathematically, we make a vector for each of our documents, where every vector has a component for every word in our dictionary, say with a component for apple somewhere at the beginning, and likewise a component for zombie somewhere near the end. And the values that we put in these vector components are then equal to the number of times the corresponding word appears in the document. And in particular, if a word doesn't appear, its component is zero. And it's not hard to see that by and away, the majority of the components in our document vector will be precisely that, zero. And this type of vector is, with one with lots of zeros, what's called a sparse representation. And it turns out that uh, machine learning models, but in particular deep learning models, don't perform particularly well with high dimensional sparse representations. And although there are smart tricks we can employ to improve this representation, for instance, by reducing dimensionality using uh, by removing stop words or regularizing using TF-IDF, at the end of the day, most of the components remain zero, and thus the representation remains unsatisfactory. So what we instead want is a low-dimensional, dense representation, and five years ago, one was discovered that has been the catalyst for many of the performance improvements we've seen recently in NLP research and its resulting applications. It's called word the vec I'm sure it's familiar to many of you in the room, uh, but for those of you who are unfamiliar with the details, here's how it works. Uh, we start with the, uh, the observation that although our data exists in some high dimensional space, not all of those dimensions are actually required for representing the data. So for instance, although we live in a three dimensional world, we can describe where each of us is at any moment using only two numbers, namely your latitude and longitude, to an extremely uh, high accuracy relative to the scale of the planet. Now, word to vec implements this idea in the word space. It starts with an encoder-decoder model, which is a go-to technique for compressing high-dimensional data. And what this model does is it tries to squeeze high-dimensional data into some low-dimensional space, and then only using that low-dimensional representation, predict what the high-dimension version originally was. And then in the traditional supervised machine learning way, we start with two random transformations, one for the encoder, one for the decoder. We feed in an example, we calculate the error on the prediction, and we use this error to improve each of the transformations slightly. We then iterate on this process over and over using lots of data until the error being generated finds the minimum and the re resulting low dimensional representations created by the trained encoder transformation can then be used for downstream tasks. Now that's how an encoder-decoder model works in general, but with word to vec the high-dimensional representation of our word is one of those vectors which was as big as our dictionary with zeros everywhere except for a one in the component corresponding to our word. It's called a one-hot encoding. And then this is transformed down to a much smaller vector using an encoder-decoder-like process. But then instead of trying to predict the one-hot encoded vector of the original word, we predict the one-hot encodings of the words surrounding the original word in the text. So for instance, if our sentence was, I hope no one has fallen asleep in my talk yet. If we want to learn a representation of the word asleep, 
we try to predict the words has, fallen, in, and my. And moreover, while learning these transformations, not only do you try to minimize the error in predicting one of the context words, but you also try to maximize the error in predicting a handful of additional words chosen at random from the dictionary, like trampoline or esophagus. And this might sound like a crazy idea, but the resulting small dimensional representations of our words were responsible for huge leaps in NLP machine learning performance, not the least of which was Google's neural tra machine translation model. Okay, now that we've got a small dimensional representation of our words, how can we make a small dimensional representation of our document? Now, one approach would be simply to take the average of all the individual word vectors in this text, but it turns out that this doesn't work the best, not in the least because the ordering of the underlying words is ignored. So, for instance, the phrase cast int to string means something very different from the phrase cast string to int. A more sophisticated approach would be to use an ordering-aware machine learning model. And this class of models in the deep learning field is called the recurrent neural network. These are stateful models. So when an input is passed through, not only is an output generated vector, sorry, output vector generated, but the internal state is updated as well. And this internal state is itself just a vector, and the idea is that as you pass your inputs through one by one, this internal state vector remembers, in some sense, what is already seen. And actually, in real deep learning applications, the output vector is typically ignored. The only thing we care about is the internal state and how that changes. Okay, so how do we then use this hidden memory vector to represent our document? Well, one approach would be to simply pass the word vectors of our individual words through the recurrent neural network in the same order as their source words are found in the text letting the hidden vector update itself over and over, and then use the final version of the hidden vector as is once the word, final word vector has been passed through. However, even though this vector in some sense remembers all of the words in the text, especially for long documents, this vector only has a very faint memory of the first words. That is, only the last words are contributing significantly to the value of the final state of the hidden vector. Alternatively, we can make a copy of the hidden vector, and after every update, uh, sorry, make a copy after, and then uh, of the hidden vector after every update, and then combine them somehow. And this is like our previous proposal of simply combining the individual word vectors. But now, by using the hidden vectors, each vector is information not only about the individual words, but also the echoes of the words coming just before those words, and, and therefore, importantly, their order. All that remains is to decide on a way of combining the hidden vectors. And we might actually be able to get away with simply averaging them, but just as we propose to do with the word vectors, uh, sorry, uh, averaging them just like we propose to do with the word vectors, but the authors of the paper did something different, called max pooling. And what you do is you make a new vector, the same size as all of our hidden vectors, and set the value of each component equal to the maximum of all the values of that component across all hidden vectors. Uh, here's an example of the result of this process. Uh, it's from the paper from the same group, but preceding the DeepCS1. And we have here code-related actions, like start a new write operation on the file and remove the old entries of a log file uh, that have been converted into vectors. These vectors have then been projected down to two dimensions for us in such a way that the spatial relationships between vectors are preserved. And we see that natural clusters arise. Loading and reading uh, actions form one blob, as do save write actions and delete remove actions. Okay, that's it for text. To recap, we start with some large body of text and identify the unique words. We use the ordering of those words in the text to learn a small dimensional embedding of the individual words. And finally, to represent a phrase, sentence, or entire document, we feed its words in order through our current neural network and combine the resulting hidden vectors via max pooling. Okay. Uh, now, having seen how to make a small dimensional representation of text, we'd like to do something similar with our code snippet. However, there are a few things we need to keep in mind. Uh, first of all, on the surface, the variable and class names we use are themselves text, but unlike most, uh, in most natural languages, there's no implied requirement that the word used uh, directly relate to the action being performed or to the role of the object. On the other hand, uh, despite how we choose to name things, 
the underlying API calls and control flows are completely unambiguous. And noticing that these calls are ordered uh, and that there's only a finite number of them, uh, we realize that we can, again, just build a dictionary of the API calls and train a small dimensional embedding of them, much like what we did with Word to Vec. So to do so, we start with some large collection of code snippets. And for each, we generate and traverse its abstract syntax tree, collecting an ordered sequence of API calls. For instance, for each constructor invocation new C, we append to our sequence the API C new. Or for each method call OM, where O is an instance of class C, we append the API call CM. Similarly, for loops and other control logic, we can append uh, the constituent API calls in some deterministic way. We then look at all of the sequences of all of our code snippets. We make a dictionary of all the API calls we find, and we assign a one-hot encoding to each API call. We then train an encoder-decoder model to predict for a given one-hot encoding of an API call in a particular sequence, the one-hot encoding of its neighboring API calls of that sequence. And just like in the text case, this results in a small dimensional representation of each API call. Lastly, to obtain a representation of the API sequence of each code snippet, we then pass these vectors in order through a recurrent neural network, though a different one from that which we use for the text, but having the same architecture. We collect the generated hidden vectors and aggregate them via max pooling. Of course, there's some flexibility in the order and the choice of the API calls and how we structure the control logic. And so this is not completely sufficient to represent the intent behind the code snippet in a general way. So to achieve that, what the team behind DCS did was to combine the API sequence embedding with the weak signals originating from the text of the code snippet. So first, we create a representation of the method name. Uh, what we do is we split the method name into its constituent tokens. We have words in word order, and therefore we can apply word to vec techniques, by which uh, by now we are familiar, along with a third recurrent neural network to generate an embedding vector. Secondly, just to ensure we don't miss any potential signals, we take the method body, split all the variable and method names into their constituent words, apply the familiar bag of word tricks we know from information retrieval like deduplication, natural language stop word removal, and code language stop word removal, that is, uh, removing all the language keywords. And then we embed the remaining words in some small dimensional vectors. Uh, we don't pass these vectors to an RNN, so since unlike the method name, uh, words and API calls, they have no strict ordering. So instead, we put them through a normal feed-forward neural network and max pool the resulting vectors. So as a concrete example, uh, here's um, some simple code that converts a date into a calendar. We have uh, the method name, and we break it up into the words to and calendar. Uh, the API sequence calendar get instance and calendar set time. Uh, and lastly, we have the unique tokens calendar, get, instance, set, time, and date, uh, which have been extracted from the code method body after having dropped the Java keywords final and return. Now, this process leaves us with three separate vectors representing all the signals we can squeeze out from a method definition. Uh, together, though, they have more dimensions than the text vectors we'll use to represent queries. As the method name alone has this many dimensions. So since we want to be able to compare the two vectors, they'll have to have the same length, and so simply concatenating the three vectors, the code method won't work. Instead, as a final step, we concatenate the three, put them through a feed-forward neural network whose output layer is the same size as the text vector. So in addition to resulting in a vector of the appropriate size, as an added benefit, uh, this last transmission will also learn to mix the individual signals coming from the method name, API calls, and method tokens in the most illuminating way. So that's it for code. To recap, first we create an embedding vector for the sequence of API calls, first by making a small dimensional representation for each of the API calls, and then by combining them with the recurrent neural network and max pooling. Second, we create an embedding of the method name, by breaking it up into its constituent words and then using word to vec another recurrent neural net, and max pooling to combine the resulting word vectors. Uh, we find all the unique word tokens in the method body, convert them to their small dimensional representations, pass them through a feed for neural, neural network, and max pool the results. And finally, we mix and downsample the resulting three embedding vectors 
first by concatenating them, and lastly by passing this concatenated vector through a feedforward neural net. So now that we have methods both for creating vectors from text and for creating vectors from code, how do we learn these transformations in such a way that the vectors representing text describing some action are close to or equal to the vectors representing code that performs those actions? Now, normally, training a machine learning model works by providing the model with an input and a target output to predict based on that input. And if the model doesn't correctly predict this target, we use the error between the prediction and target to slightly adjust the internal parameters of the model so that the next time it makes a better prediction. But in the embedding case, we don't really have a target output for either the natural language transformation model nor the code transformation model. Instead, our target is that the vector for a piece of text describing an action and the vector embedding the code actually performing that action be close to one another, if not overlapping. To achieve this, we use a technique what's called a joint embedding, where instead of looking at the output of the natural language and code transformation separately, we compare their vector outputs, and we seek to minimize the angle between them. Additionally, just like in word to vec it turns out that this training procedure works even better if we simultaneously also seek to maximize the angle between the code snippets vector and the vector of some action description that has nothing to do with the action the code is actually performing. So it's by optimizing for this combined goal that we simultaneously train our two embeddings. Uh, and this joint model is what the authors of the paper call the Code Description Embedding Neural Network, or Code NN. OK, so we've got a method for embedding textual description of actions into a small dimensional vector space. We've got a method for embedding the associated code definitions into the same small dimensional vector space. And we've got a trick for learning both embeddings simultaneously. And this is a supervised machine learning problem, so where's all the training data going to come from? Now, as a demonstration of the feasibility of this idea, the team behind Code NN developed a system for code search called DeepCS. The system works in three phases. The first uses 18 million Java methods and their associated doc strings, all scraped from GitHub, to train both the code and the natural language embeddings. This is done once. Uh, the code and doc strings are then discarded, and only the learned transformations are retained. This training data set is purposely quite broad in order to guarantee that the representations learned will also be useful for as yet unseen code bases, that is to say, yours. Next, you throw away all the code snippets from your code base without doc strings into the system, and the previously learned transformations are then used to convert all of these methods into vectors. This is done once, but you can imagine a situation where code that was touched during the day has its vector representation recalculated at night. Notice too that this is a relatively cheap operation relative to the training required to learn the original transformations. And lastly, now that DeepCS is ready for search, uh, when a user of the system wants to find a relevant piece of code, uh, he or she enters their natural language query into the system. DeepCS transforms the textual query into a vector, performs a search to find the k nearest code vectors to that natural language query vector, and returns the corresponding code snippets to the user in decreasing order of proximity. Okay, so we've talked today about an interesting problem to embedding code snippets and how that can be jointly learned with a text embedding to improve performance on the code search problem. Now, a natural question is, of course, to ask, is this just a nice story? Or is there really some strength to the idea? So as a test, the author scraped almost 10,000 Java projects that have at least 20 stars on GitHub, none of which were included in the training corpus. And then they encoded the methods of those projects. They then made a benchmark of queries from the top 50 voted Java programming questions on Stack Overflow, queries such as generating random integers in a specific range, how do I get a platform-dependent new line character, and removing white space from strings. They then looked at the ordered search results with those produced by Lucene-based systems and by CodeHow, which is what the, the authors of the paper considered state-of-the-art, and found that in, both in terms of position of the first relevant result, where lower is better, and percentage of relevant results in the top end results, where higher is better, DeepCS vastly outperformed its competitors. And what this tells me 
is that there are almost certainly other niche uh, search tasks out there for which using machine learning and joint embeddings will provide a market performance boost uh, over the non-embedding techniques used currently. Rounding up, I'd like to thank Zhao Donggu, uh, Hong Yu Zhang, and Sung Hung Kim for their novel idea, my employer, GoData Driven, for flying me out here and letting me speak on company time, and you, the audience, for your attention. And now, if there's any time for questions, I would be happy to field them. Thank you very much, Robert. We'll go first with the questions. Just wondering, were there any uh, explorations of how well this would work for languages with code generation capabilities, uh, whether they're like really primitive, like C's macros, or more advanced, like Rust macros? Because uh, Java seems like an easy scenario for this compared to a lot of other languages. Uh, so the paper is um, so the proof of concept was done in Java in the paper. Uh, the authors made a mention that they said that uh, this should work in principle for any other language, uh, so long as people are using reasonable names for their variables. Okay, we have another question. Or yeah, okay. exactly. Wonderful talk, thank you so much. Did the authors look at like sort of security analysis? Like am I calling methods out of order? Am I violating a contract? I mean, did they sort of think of that as future work or? No. Okay. Yes. Uh, correlation to uh, commit messages maybe? Sorry, one more time, please. Uh, correlation. Did you check any correlation with commit messages? Commit messages? Uh, no, that was not done. Any other interesting question? Come on. I'm going to count to three. One, two, three. Okay, no more questions. Thank you again, Robert. Thank you.